This is a production of Cornell University. Um, but I will, I apologize to those of you who were, were here yesterday, but I will repeat one or two things, but I try and keep the repetition to a minimum because what I want to talk about today is, is global atmospheric change and how we, how we might be able to adapt crops to that particularly with respect to rising carbon dioxide and also try and explain why I think there is mileage in trying to make those adaptations. Um, I should say at the outset that I can only give this talk uh, because of the work done by past graduate students Lisa Rainsworth, Carl Bernacki, uh, Will Hay, Jing Wan Zhu um, and postdocs Justin McGrath and Venkat Srinivasan, and also um, faculty colleagues Don Ort and Praveen Kumar, who've all helped um, in doing this work. Oh, and Darren Drury, who was a postdoc, working with me as well. Um, so this is where I work, the Institute of Genomic Biology at the University of Illinois. Um, in front of that are the Morrow Plots, the oldest agricultural experiment outside of Rothamsted, England. Um, and I just wanted to show this sort of connection that we have. So much of the field work I'll show you is done um, very close to this location. So a lot of the work shows an interplay between lab modeling and field work. And I hope, I hope that'll be apparent. So what are we concerned about? Um, whatever is debated, there is no debate about the fact that the carbon dioxide atmosphere in the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere is rising um, and it's really rising at a quite unprecedented rate in geological history at, at the present time. Um, most of our crop ancestors evolved in the average CO2 concentration of the last 10 million years which was about 220 parts per million. Today we're over 400 parts per million so we're we're close to doubling what those crop ancestors evolved, evolved in. Um, if we look at what is driving climate change in the atmosphere, then CO2, of course, is the biggest contributor to this, but also methane, nitrous oxide, halocarbons are an important part of this, and one that's often overlooked is tropospheric ozone. Most greenhouse gases are heterotomic molecules, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, but ozone also behaves as a heterotomic molecule and it absorbs infrared radiation. So it is a part of the greenhouse effect when it's in the troposphere. Um, in the stratosphere, of course, it's important in absorbing UV radiation. And our activities have greatly increased ozone in, in the troposphere. And that ozone is also toxic to plants, so it has a direct effect as well as an indirect effect. Um, other aspects, uh, aerosols actually cause a cooling effect. Um, increase in cloud cover as we warm up the atmosphere has a feedback effect as well. But overall, the anthropogenic effect is strongly positive, leading to uh, increased energy in the troposphere. So that is predicted to lead to, on average, a 1 to 2 degree C temperature rise by 2050. Now, although precipitation is rising, um, Drought is also rising because with rising temperature, we have more evapotranspiration. Also, the, with increased energy in the atmosphere, events become more intense, uh, more, if you like, chaotic. So this will probably also lead to more drought events. We think that surface ozone today averages about 50 parts per billion in the northern hemisphere we think that will rise to between 60 to 90 parts per billion. Depending on whether really controls proposed by a number of companies really, sorry, countries bite or whether they don't. A lot of this rise is actually south of us in the tropics, 
particularly in East Asia as well. But these are really, if you like, three major, four major global change issues that our crops will have to face by 2050. And indeed are facing already because, you know, as I said, the crop ancestors evolved in a CO2 concentration that is very different to the one we have today. And indeed, tropospheric ozone, we think pre-industrially was probably no more than 10 parts per billion. Today it averages 50 parts per billion. We frequently see 100 parts per billion in central Illinois um, today. So, so what is the problem? Uh, what are the impacts of rising CO2? And how might we adapt to rising CO2? They're the three things I want to try and look at. So again, as I showed yesterday, our four major crops globally in terms of, if you like, these are the crops that provide over two thirds directly or indirectly of human calories. Um, so maize is number one um, and it's C4, so it has a different response to rising CO2. Um, rice and wheat on the other hand, the C3, very important as direct sources of human calories. And then soy, very important protein source. So those last three are all C3 crops and should respond very strongly to rising carbon dioxide. And as I showed yesterday, um, we're responsible for, all, the United States produces almost a third of the world's soy production, a very significant part of wheat production, and over a third of, of maize production. Now, if we look at how we're improving the yield of these crops, then if we take the historical trajectory and we say, well, we ought to be able to continue that into the future, then we would end up at this point by 2050. But what FAO and John Foley's group at um, Minnesota have projected is that this is what we will need by 2050. So we really need to get onto this trajectory because staying on this one will result in significant shortages, significant price increases that will affect the poorest in the global community. I should also point out that um, I've just added on here cassava. Cassava is a crop which many, many smallholders, poor communities, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, depend on. And I think these yield improvements which we show for our major crops are not apparent in some of these min what we might call minor crops, but actually extremely important crops for those those communities. We we have failed to improve those at the rate that we're improving our our best crops, or rather, shouldn't say our best crops, our if you like our top crops, the ones which particularly matter to the developed world. Um, the picture though is a little bit worse because. If we look at these rice and wheat, for example, the same is true of soy, that if we look at during the Green Revolution years, then we were improving average global yields by 30 to 40 percent per decade. So a huge change in global food supply. The, this really eliminated the f major famines that had been seen in the 1960s. So. So the Green Revolution had a huge impact at that stage, but as we move away, we see that wheat and rice, really the yield improvements are, are declining. And in fact, in the last decade, wheat wasn't improved at all, and rice is now in single figures. Now, I just want to put up an equation developed by John Monteith at Rothamsted, which explains at least why we may be running out of steam with genetic yield potential. I.e. the yield a crop will achieve when it's grown under optimum conditions. So no diseases, no pests, um, adequate water and adequate nutrients. And what this tells us is that the yield of a crop will depend on how much sunlight is available for photosynthesis by the crop, 
Um, and I should say here we're just interested in the visible sunlight because that is all plants use in photosynthesis. Um, how good they are at capturing that light. So what is the efficiency with which they capture it during the growing season? How efficient are they at then converting that captured light into um, biomass? And then how good are they at partitioning that biomass into the part of the crop we care about? So the grain of wheat, the grain of rice. And these are just data for a soybean crop on our university farm, modern soybean crop, growing on, not growing with irrigation, but growing on a deep Midwest soil where there's plenty of water available. And basically what we see is that interception efficiency and partitioning efficiency are already remarkably high. And the, these are, um, in the case of rice and wheat, these are products of the Green Revolution. That's really what we changed in rice and wheat, that partitioning efficiencies went up from 30% to 60%. Interception efficiencies improved as well. And if we really you know, look at these, these are pretty well hitting on their biological maxima. So there isn't really much more we can squeeze out of those. Um, but so what I should point out is this number, conversion efficiency, and this is really a very good number for most crops, a 3%, is only a third of the theoretical value. So conversion efficiency, photosynthesis, is one thing where there's an opportunity still to improve on um, yield potential, genetic yield potential. So how does CO2 tie into this? What does CO2 do to crop plants? Well, from a theoretical point of view, the only way a plant can sense CO2, the, t the CO2 changes at the levels that we're dealing with. If you put a plant in 10% um, CO2, then you change its pH and all sorts of things start to happen. But if you just, for example, elevate CO2 from where we are today to where we think we'll be in the latter half of this century, there are only really two ways a plant can sense this. One is the key carboxylase in photosynthesis, Rubisco, um, is not CO2 saturated and it also um, catalyzes a process called photorespiration. CO2 increases saturation of Rubisco and it inhibits that oxygenation reaction which leads to photorespiration. So it's sensed at Rubisco. It's also sensed at the level of stomata and how this happens is not fully understood but stomata will close um, in response to rising CO2 and we, we don't know how much of that is really a direct effect. But if you strip off the epidermis of many plants, float them on water, subject them to elevated CO2, you will see a closing response. Now it was thought for many years um, that respiration was also affected by CO2. People took out their, some of you may be familiar with Lycor gas exchange systems or other gas exchange systems. They, they put these on plants, elevated the CO2 in the chamber and they saw a suppression of respiration. But we were very suspicious that what's going on is it's very difficult to prevent CO2 from leaking out of these systems, completely prevent it. And um, so what we eventually managed to do was get a manufacturer who could actually give us a differential oxygen system. Um, this was about a year of work, but so that we could instead measure oxygen uptake, which is much more of a challenge because there is so much more oxygen in the atmosphere. But but when we eventually got this working to our satisfaction, the, the postdoc in the lab who was doing it was saying, well, I'm doubling CO2 and I'm not seeing anything. So I said, well, put through 1% CO2 and see what happens. He put through 1% CO2 and we saw absolutely nothing. So we published that in Plant Physiology and I think the idea that CO2 is suppressing 
respiration has gone away uh, now. So at least we can, whoops, sorry. We can simplify what really a, a plant can see in terms of CO2 now. So at the level of Rubisco, what CO2 is doing is um, CO2, of course, is the substrate for conversion of IUBP to two molecules of phosphoglycolate in the Calvin cycle. But oxygen also um, reacts, catalyzed by Rubisco, because that's why there's the O on the end of Rubisco, to produce glycolate. If glycolate is produced, then the plant recycles that back to PGA but in doing so, it loses a carbon dioxide. It consumes a great deal of um, the NADPH and ATP generated by the light reactions. So it imposes an inefficiency on the overall photosynthetic process. If you elevate CO2, you do two things. You increase the saturation of Rubisco with CO2, and you competitively inhibit this oxygenation reaction. So that, that is why glasshouse growers, it's worth their while elevating their toma tomato crop with CO2 because they get a, a high yield precisely because of this mechanism. So it's harder when it comes to field crops though to assess what CO2 will do. And so a lot of the information we have comes from chamber systems, greenhouses, um, controlled environments, and also small chambers put over crops in the field. But when you do this, even in the field situation, you're changing a lot of things. You're lowering the light level, you're raising temperature a little bit, you're raising humidity, you're completely altering coupling with, with the movement of the air. And you've got edge effects, because often the crop around the edges of this has been knocked down and so lights coming in from the side and so we, re we were really basing much of our prediction on what would happen on crops on very artificial systems that Monsanto or Syngenta would never use plots this size to decide whether their latest transgene is is doing anything they want an open crop field many of them to do this and yet we are basically um, predicting our future on experiments much smaller and much simpler than industry would ever use for its business model. So when I moved to Illinois, there was a chance there, with, particularly with the university farm and a big engineering school, to do something different. And this was something I actually first developed for ozone, work with ozone and atmospheric pollutants by Andrew McLeod in the UK and then was taken up by Brookhaven National Lab um, when I worked there in the early 90s. And then when I moved to Illinois, there was a chance to really refine that, which is what we did. And um, well, what the engineers did, I didn't do it. But, but basically what these systems do is that here we have our soybean crop. We do the same thing in maize. Um, and also this has been done with wheat and rice. Um, we've given our design to groups in China, which have now done this very successfully with rice. But basically what happens is if the wind is coming in this direction, it's sensed here, um, and CO2 is released on the upwind side, it's feathered so that most is released immediately upwind and then less as you go to the sides. And it's stepped according to the wind speed as well. In the center we have a CO2 analyzer an infrared analyzer to check that the algorithm is doing the right thing. And if it is over, it backs it off. If it's under, it releases more. And so here you can see a test of the system. We switch it on at this point, and with target is 550 parts per million. And it, it gets within plus or minus 10% of that target for about 96% of the time over the growing season. This is an infrared image, oh, sorry. This is an infrared image. And of course, as I said, CO2 causes partial stomatal closure. So the plants are transpiring less. They're losing less heat, latent heat. Therefore, they get warmer. 
and so you can see um, that it's warmer within the ring and that's fairly uniform compared to the outside. Um, now, um, one of my former students and one of my former postdocs both went away from Illinois and then came back as faculty and they're now doing their own experiments in this system and Andrew Leakey has developed a rain out shelter system where actually his sh this deploys at night when we get about a th two thirds of our rainfall in fact in the corn belt due to um, convectional storms so if the, if rain if the thing senses rain it deploys a shelter which collects the rain in the gutter pipes that away from the site and he imposes a drought here Carl has developed uh, an open air heating system so he can raise the temperature of the crop within these rings as well so we've now got CO2 drought and temperature combined um, so within the experiment we've got those added on these rings are about 20 meter diameter so gives you over 300 square meters of crop so you can do a lot of things with with that that you can't do with a small system and so you can look at everything from gene expression to the final yield um, harvested with a small plot combine we've so we have four of these in soybean and replicated in maize that are in co2 <coughs> four in elevated ozone, four looking at the combination and then controls and then we have split plots with the temperature and drought treatments. We've also looked at a range of cultivars in there as well although for most breeders 26 is way too small to really do any breeding project but you could replicate this technology up to much larger areas. Um, so what did we find when we did this under the open air? Well, um, and I should say, this has also been done with wheat. This was an experiment in Arizona. This was an experiment in Japan. And there have been more of those around the world, but too, too few, I believe. So this, is, this shows um, soybean and wheat data from different chamber experiments. And so you can fit a line to those against CO2. But this is what we found in our face experiment. Of course, that's just one CO2 level. But basically, we were finding it's what we see under open air conditions is about half of what had been reported on average in chamber conditions. And with maize, the picture was even worse. That this is the projection from chambers. And of course, many of these plants are grown in but they're all pretty well grown, nearly all grown in pots. Um, and this is what we see in the open air. So no stimulation at all. And we've done this now over, over 10 years. We still haven't seen a yield increase. Um, so Lisa Ainsworth looked at this in more detail. That, that was published in 2006. By 2008, there were twice as many face experiments to draw on. And she showed again that what you see un in the open air, the nearest proxy to a farmer's field, was only half of what was expected. It's, the modelers, I think, are still not convinced of our results. And even in the latest IPCC, they're suggesting that rising CO2 will rescue us from the problems of rising temperature and, and drought. I, I don't subscribe to that view, and I think we if there's doubt about it we should be trying to look at how we could adapt to it if we don't need it that would be great but if we do it'll be too late if we don't start doing something now so um, if we look at go back to John Monteith's equations what we see is indeed conversion efficiency at the crop level is increased and that plays through to yield but it's only about half of what we think we should get so how might we adapt to that rising CO2 and try and get the kind of yield increase we think we should obtain? Um, again, 
we this is something we started when I was working on the project but Lisa Ainsworth has now taken this much further and what we're doing here is looking at genetic variation in response and so if we look at seed yield a range of cultivars we can see that this basically means no response but up here we've got cultivars that are clearly responding more strongly so it appears there are some genetics there that could be exploited to adapt the crop but really to do this you would need a much if you like a much larger face system and you probably need you'd need it in different locations because we're pretty well in the center of the soybean growing area but there's plenty of soybean grown in Minnesota, plenty grown south of us where growing season lengths conditions are quite different. But it does suggest that this is something that could well be exploited. Um, one of the major um, issues is really that around this Rubisco issue. So we know from theory what should happen which should be about a 30% yield increase and we can sometimes see that in chamber experiments but in practice we're getting a lot less. Um, so as I mentioned CO2 is if you like suppressing photorespiration and enhancing CO2 uptake but temperature has the opposite effect. Temperature makes Rubisco less specific so as temperature increases, Rubisco becomes less able to discriminate between oxygen and CO2 and photorespiration goes up. And if you, you model this from Rubisco kinetics, put that into a crop canopy, what you see is that this is the actual gain you get with temperature. Um, sorry, this is the actual photosynthesis at the canopy level this is what you could get if you eliminated photorespiration and that gain that difference becomes much bigger with rising temperature so we've got two things going on rising co2 and rising temperature working against each other now one way in which this could be overcome synthetically is for example well, c4 photosynthesis is one of those if we could make these crops C4 then we could overcome this problem. Another way um, and Maureen Hansen and I have both been involved in this area is that cyanobacteria, the ancestors of the chloroplasts, um, also have these bodies called carboxysomes where, which contain their rubisco. They actively take up bicarbonate into their cells and they also um, will hydrate any CO2 as well so that out here you have a high concentration of bicarbonate and no carbon dioxide. In this body called the carboxysome they have carbonic anhydrase which catalyzes the conversion of bicarbonate to CO2 so there's a very high concentration of CO2 here which the Rubisco can take up because there's a high concentration of CO2 they do not have photorespiration so there's an active effort now to try and engineer this system into the chloroplast so that would be one way of dealing with this Justin McGrath who's been working with Maureen and myself um, on modeling this system has, re has developed a diffusion um, reaction model which really looks at all these components and the sequence in which this would ideally be engineered but basically what he shows is in theory if you could put this in to a crop plant like soybean you could get almost a um, up to a 60 percent increase in CO2 uptake. Now um, Will Hay working with Tom Clementi and myself put in just one cyanobacterial gene whose function is still really unknown but it, there's a, quite a lot of evidence that it appears to improve CO2 access to Rubisco and so we'll put, so we'll using 
um, soybean transformed with this one gene showed that photosynthesis was indeed increased, seed mass was increased, and these are field trials. One of the most important findings he made was that the maximum efficiency of light-limited photosynthesis went up. And this was statistically significant. Um, and there's only really three ways in which this is possible. You have a different Rubisco, which seems highly unlikely because um, the large subunit at least is, doesn't have multiple forms. Um, there's more oxygen, which again, sorry, less oxygen, which again is extremely difficult because there's 21% outside. So inside it's probably 29%. The only other way is to have more CO2 at Rubisco. And so this seemed good evidence that that was what was happening. Um, just mention, of course, not everything is predictable. And I, I showed examples yesterday with pests of soybean. One of the other things we see with, um, and this was a bit of a shock, was that under elevated CO2, and I hope it's apparent there, um, it, the crop is green at the end of the growing season when it's yellow outside. And um, in fact, it should have been the other way around because the crop's warmer, heat accelerates development, and it should have gone yellow inside before it was green outside. And in fact, the, the engineer at the site, I was telling him, tell me when it goes yellow inside because I wanted to take a picture of it. And I kept calling him every morning and he said, no, no. And eventually he sheepishly said, I think it's green inside. <laughs> so, so I said, oh, that can't be possible. So I went out there and sure enough, it was green inside the ring and yellow outside. So, so by boosting photosynthesis and carbohydrate supply, it appears that we've delayed senescence of of the crop because this crop is genetically identical. You can see it's all in the same field. Um, now, this was very intriguing because what we then found was these are the tra these are the wild type soybean same generation as these ones which were transformed. And at the end of the season, boosting photosynthesis appeared to delay senescence. So that was another very interesting parallel. They, these tran transgenic plants appeared just like the wild type ones, given more CO2. Um, oh sorry. I, I move on from this but one of the ways which we could adapt the plant to rising co2 is exactly around this issue of rubisco that if we um, look at the response of photosynthesis to the co2 inside the leaf so we're eliminating a stomatal effect in this diagram what we see is that as we increase co2 photosynthesis increases rapidly then it reaches a transition point where it rises more slowly. What is happening here is that you're saturating the carboxylation reaction of Rubisco. And um, then when you get to this point, you now become limited by the supply of RUBP, not directly by the supply of CO2. But I'm not sure how I've managed to do that. Um, Good. <laughs> so, um, so, but you can see there's still a rise here. And the reason for this is although RUBP is limiting, because you're increasing CO2, you're progressively inhibiting the oxygenation reaction. So more of that limiting supply of RUBP is being used in photosynthesis and less in photorespiration. Now, if we... Um, what we tend to find is at current CO2 levels, so if at a given stomatal conductance, what will happen is as we increase photosynthesis, the CO2 concentration inside the leaf will drop because photosynthesis is removing CO2. The stomates are limiting 
that CO2. So inside the leaf you have lower CO2 than outside. At this point inside and outside are the same. And what we typically find this point, the operating point, is very close to this transition. And that makes sense. The leaf has optimized its investment in Rubisco versus apparatus for regenerating um, IUBP. But now if we move out to an elevated CO2 situation, we've unbalanced this. That we've now got um, we've got far more rubisco than we need, and we're limited entirely by the apparatus for regeneration of IUBP. So in theory, what we could do is we could decrease rubisco and if you like we could have the same photosynthetic rate but be more nitrogen use efficient because rubisco is about 25 percent of the nitrogen in the leaf so it's a lot of nitrogen or we could use that resource instead to increase capacity for regeneration of IUBP and have for the same amount of nitrogen have even more CO2 fixed. Now of course a question you might ask is well does the plant know this? If you grow it under elevated CO2, does it acclimate in this way? Um, and these are data that Carbonaki took during his PhD work, where indeed the plant seems to know a little bit of this. And what he found was there was a decrease in this initial slope and a slight rise in the plateau. But it was nowhere near enough to reach the theoretical gain. Um, so, yeah, I should. So, um, so one of the other things we looked at was this issue of regeneration, and Jing Wanju, who was a graduate student in the lab at the same time as Carl, uh, worked with me on developing a complete model of photosynthesis, where we represented the whole system by a series of linked differential equations that we eventually got to replicate what the leaf was doing in terms of CO2 uptake in in vivo. Um, and this just shows some of the uh, classic responses we see, if you like, in one of these cuvettes. Uh, this just shows that we could simulate these responses with, with the model, so these dynamic responses. Um, we could then use the system to basically optimize investment. So we could say, well, apply, if you like, an evolutionary algorithm to say, OK, where should we be investing to regenerate RUBP more efficiently? And it picked out, in particular, this one enzyme, SBPAs. But there are a number of other changes it suggested, FBPAs as well, FBP outlays, all of which we're now looking at, in, uh, particularly in tobacco, but probably will test in soybean. And my colleague Christine Rains in England uh, did this with tobacco. Here are plants in the glass house. We put those out in our soy face experiment and could replicate it in, in the field. Um, one of the things we found though was that, and I'll skip over this, was that under elevated CO2 the response was even greater. And that got us intrigued. Um, you know, and of course it fits in with the theory I showed you that it should be greater under elevated CO2. Uh, so one of the other things we did went back to with the model was to say, well, it was curious that SBPAs is a really very small amount of the total protein in the leaf. It would be, in theory, it would be very easy for a plant to evolve more SBPAs at a very low cost. So we reran the model at 220 parts per, per million, per billion, per million, sorry, the concentration under which we think the crop ancestors evolved. And we, sorry, we looked at uh, flux control. In, this was in the model. And it suggested, well, SBPAs would invert, in, would have no control over CO2 fixation under those conditions. But at 390 ppm, it would have a strong control. At 700, it would be even more. And Rubisco would be moving in the opposite direction. So that was consistent with what we saw
in these experiments. Um, I just very briefly mentioned this, but another thing that we also have done with modeling is Rubisco appears to have a trade-off that this specificity um, factor, i.e. where plant, if you like, we think that plants have evolved to become very obviously very specific for CO2 against a very strong oxygen background so that we find that crop plants tend to have a specificity of 90 in, in favor of CO2. But as you go out to C4 plants, where the rubisco is in a high CO2 environment, or bacteria, where they might be in anaerobic environments, specificity drops, but catalytic rate increases. So the thinking is that to get tighter binding, um, catalytic rate has to drop. So there's a trade-off. And to cut a short, uh, long story short, what we found was that um, you, there should be an optimum at any CO2 concentration. What we found was that that optimum was a specificity of about 90, a pre uh, rather the 220 ppm in which the plants probably evolved. But today it's much lower. So there'd be a big advantage in, if you like, getting in a foreign Rubisco, which might have a lower specificity, but a higher K-cat. And indeed, we, we modeled this. Amaranthus edulis Rubisco, which is C4, actually fits these specs. And in the model, it will give you about a 17% gain for no increase in nitrogen. If you could replace the lower canopy Rubisco um, with um, a, a further different Rubisco, you could get up to 30% gain. Well, when we did that, that all seemed a bit uh, pie in the sky because Rubisco's coded for in both the plastid and the nucleus, extremely difficult to put into higher plants. But this is a picture from the paper in Nature from Maureen's group and Martin Parry's in Rothamsted, where they've really shown you can take very distant Rubisco's get them into tobacco, and at least you can get the plants to survive to, to flowering. So, so these things are becoming, as the technology moves forward, these things are becoming more and more possible. Finally, I just want to sort of point out, you can also apply this type of evolutionary algorithm at the canopy level. And Darren Drury, working with me as a postdoc, did this with, again, soybean canopies. And I won't go into all the details of this, but basically what he showed was that you could, by changing canopy leaf reflectivity, the angles of the leaves, optimizing those, and also the number of leaves, you could get quite a significant gain in carbon uptake. You could also, for warmer environments, you could cool the canopy as well. And so, and we know now some of the genes, for example, that determine hinging of leaves, so these things are becoming possibilities. We can tie them in with phytochrome responses, so, uh, promoters for phytochrome responses, so they do a different thing at the top of the canopy to the bottom of the canopy. Now, one of the things it predicted was that actually soybeans produce too many leaves, that if, if they invested in fewer leaves, you would get more gain. And so, of course, we were thinking of what, um, what genotype might be available in which we could test this. Um, Venkat, the graduate student who was working with us at the time, was an engineer. He'd done the modeling. So he wasn't in on the conversations we had about genotypes. Instead, he started an ex replicated experiment in the field where he cut off every um, fourth emerging leaf uh, so that he was preventing the plant from investing in these extra leaves and what he found was that sorry every third developing leaf what he got was a significant 10 percent increase in yield there seemed to be two reasons for that one is that the canopy actually has more li more leaves than it really needs so it's it's respiratory load 
by having extra leaves actually outweighs the gain of more leaves. But of course, in an evolutionary sense, this might be beneficial because you never know when a herbivore is going to come along and remove half of what you've got. Um, but in the farmer's field, it's a disadvantage. The other is by cutting them off early, you prevent the plant from investing resource in that developing leaf. And it resulted in a, an increase in yield, and we've done that two years running now. Um, so it <laughs> involves quite a lot of undergraduate time as well. But, <laughs> but um, he also, we, we had a field assimilation chamber where we could actually test out the idea that it really is resulting in a higher net CO2 uptake as well as a high yield. So uh, as I mentioned yesterday, we're with Gates Foundation funding, we've now got an I a chance to test many of these ideas in the field. Um, and so to summarize, I think there is a very serious problem that we're potentially going to have a shortfall in primary foodstuffs. There, you know, there are arguments against that, but I don't think we should be taking chances. We should prepare, we should be ensuring ourselves against an uncertain future, both in human behavior um, and in climate driven by that, um, that the potential yield increases of rising CO2 are not fully realized in our current crops. But there are genetic and biotech solutions, although field facilities are seriously lacking to do that. Are we just not willing to spend what we need to spend on on those field facilities which which would be a tiny fraction of the cost we're putting into other things doe just spent 100 million near us drilling into the deep rocks to see if it could capture a small amount of co2 that that will be enough to pay for breeding facilities at least three sites around the country to actually adapt to these problems and just again finish by thanking all the people who've made this possible. In particular, I should mention this is Jing Wan Zhu and Donald, my colleague, who's worked closely with me. Um, Lisa Ainsworth and uh, Andrew Leakey have mentioned as well. And uh, so Carl is somewhere in these pictures. But with that, I finish and thank you for your attention. So. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.